Hey, what's up garden friends? Jeff here, how's everybody doing? Hope you're doing well, I'm great. Gonna get right into it. I have a croton that needs to be repotted. Talked in last week's video about some issues I've been having with spider mites. If you know what I'm talking about, that's all in last week's video. Been using predator mites and they weren't doing the job and discovered that this croton had spider mites all over it. So I ordered like 30,000 more. <laughs> that should do the trick, right? At least one would hope. So I'm gonna get this repotted, give the leaves a nice wipe down and then just cover it and predator mites. I did already hose it down very, very heavily. I did that last night. Did that last night so the plant would be dry to work with today while I filmed the video. Can't typically have crotons outside this time of year in St. Louis. It's pretty chilly here in January. It's also why the backdrop's not very attractive because, you know, January. But luckily, have a couple of nice warm days here. Uh, spider mites don't have anything to do with why this is getting repotted. This croton, as you can uh, do I need to explain? You see why it needs to be repotted? It can't even stand upright. It's been in this container for a few years. I don't like to repot crotons all that often because they just throw a fit when they get repotted. They drop their leaves and tend to not look great, but hey, you want to drop some leaves while you have a spider mite problem? Go for it. Good timing. Less for the critters to munch on. This is currently in a 20 gallon container and the this is this is the best I could do. That's what I have. I know, not super attractive, but Beggars can't be choosers. It's just going to have to do. I can spray paint it in the springtime. I'm not really concerned with how it looks, especially if you compare it to the container that's in right now, right? Raggedy, sure, but definitely still an improvement. Okay, so now we're all caught up. Y'all know what's going on, right? Not gonna be doing any sprays or anything on this like I had anticipated. It did get a spray right after I finished filming last week's video. I rinsed it off and then sprayed it. Then I had another rinse last night to get all those oils off and to blast off spider mites. Figured it'd be better to do outdoors, right? Don't wanna do that in the grow space. And now the fun part can get onto repotting a great big giant croton. So this container, when I look at it, First thing I need to do is look at the drainage situation. That is not going to cut it. So I need to go inside, grab a drill, and uh, pop some more holes in this, preferably some bigger ones. The holes in the pot are very important. Drainage with crotons is absolutely crucial. They're very prone to root rot. Having wet feet doesn't serve them any good. So I like to get as many holes in the pot as I can, as you can see. And in addition to just putting them along the bottoms, I like to have a few that are right on the edge of the bottom and the sides. So that way, if there's any water pulled up, it can get out of there. I also typically like to use a larger <laughs> drill bit. I normally would use a just a hole bit, you know, the circular bit to drill nice big holes. Usually an inch is good enough. The nice big holes and then you don't have to drill anywhere near as many of them and they take longer to clog up with roots and decompose soil. Decompose soil eventually turns into like a mud and that can clog the holes up. But mine's all worn out and broken, which is ironic because just the other day I was walking around the hardware store and they had a pack of them. I said I should probably grab some of those and I didn't. So there's the bottom. That should do the trick. That'll allow all the water to get out of there just fine. And in the springtime when I move this back outside, because it's going to go back in the house, pretty sure I mentioned that, I can go in here, lay the plant on its side, and I can still drill those out and make them bigger. That'll work just fine. Since we're talking about drainage, that moves on to the potting mix. Crotons like a organically rich, well-drained soil. One of the most basic things we hear when it comes to house plants, right? You can break that down and get more specific. They like a soil that not only drains well, but is also slightly on the acidic side and should have some organic material in there. That just helps to develop better roots. If you're using a potting mix like this miracle Grow here that I'm kneeling down on, that's mostly just peat and perlite, not a lot of other stuff to it. It's a very sterile environment, which has its purposes, and there are good reasons to go with something like that. But I do like something that has some organics in it. So I have three different options right here. You can see this one right here. It says all-purpose garden soil. So that's something we would never use in a container. It'll become very compact and muddy, not going to drain well. That's to go in the ground. I do, however, this particular mix right here, I usually take a handful of it because it, it's this garden swill, this particular one, is basically compost. So I will usually take a handful of that and mix it in with my potting mix. Sometimes more than a handful. I just like to make sure that there are some sticks and twigs, nice, meaty-looking, earthy things <laughs> inside my potting mix. So out of the three that I have here, there's the espoma in the back, miracle Grow over there. Obviously, not going to use that, not in full. I'm going to go with the espoma. Nothing against the miracle Grow. I actually just picked this up in case that espoma isn't enough, and then I'm going to have to blend them together, which will be fine. Nothing wrong with doing that. This is going to be the part of the video where I explained why I was using the espoma, and the reasoning for that is that I've been using it for a few years now, and well, a couple of years, 
and I like the way that it dries. It tends to dry out pretty quickly, which is a problem when I'm running drip. I've had issues getting nice, good coverage with my drip because that's more of a water pressure issue, but it's something to factor in. Not really relevant to this, but that's why I wanted to use it. It's mostly coconut based. There's feather, meal, and alfalfa, and a whole bunch of other, you know, a whole bunch of organic material in there, and coconut, which is the reason that it tends to dry so quickly. But looking at this blend, I'm gonna try and get this in the light so you can see it. The lighting's not fantastic for this. I'm gonna do my best to get that in the light so you can see what the problem is here. Nice, dark, rich soil. It's something usually would love to see. Squeeze it down nice and tight and let go. I'm not loving this consistency. It's not, I'm not gonna say muddy. Just this particular batch is not as light and fluffy as I would like to see. As light and fluffy is the entire reason that I was going to use it. Still a fine mix, but I think I'm going to cut it with the miracle Grow. That'll help lighten it up. Still going to get all that nice organic material that's in the Espoma mix, and then I'll just save the compost for something else. There's basically compost in this mix right here. Then for contrast, here's the miracle Grow. See that? Light and fluffy, giving it a good squeeze. Still slightly holding together, but nowhere near like how it is with the Espoma. I was going to go 50-50, but I'm thinking I'm gonna go mostly miracle Grow with this. And with what's in there, I'm just going to get them mixed together. Went and blended that up, trying to work all the clumps out. And then I'm gonna pull this up as far as I can to the sides. That just makes back filling easier once I get the root mass in from the croton. This is also why when people ask what brand of potty mix I recommend, I don't usually like to give a straight answer because there's batching consistencies. You saw that as Boma Mix, which is normally great, and I would still consider that great, but not for this. I wouldn't want to put a croton in that. It was too wet, too chunky. That hasn't been sitting out in the elements either. That's been inside my garage for the last two months, probably, something like that. It's just a bag that I bought to repot plants during the winter time. And I noticed when I picked it up, I was like, this is pretty heavy. It wasn't sitting near any water or anything like that. It's just a batch that's going to hold water more. And that's great for certain plants like ferns and spathophyllum. I'm not comfortable using it for the croton. You saw it, it was a beautiful soil, but not one that I think is going to drain fast enough for the plant. Crotons are just so prone to root rot, not worth the risk. There are of course things that could be done to fix that issue with the soil. Could add some sand, some perlite, anything that's gonna help make it nice and fluffy. That would be an option, but again, it's January. I don't have any of my equipment out here with me, like my wheelbarrows, my nice shovels that I use to mix things up with. It would just be a bit of a headache, and I have the bag of miracle Grow right there, and that's a fine mix. You can see it right here. Looks pretty good to me. I see peat, I see sand, I see perlite, I see sticks and twigs. I suppose it's organic material that can break down and does help add to aeration having various sized materials in there. I like diversity of materials in a mix that's going to aid in airflow and oxygen around the roots of the plants and with drainage. So I'm fine with there being some wood chunks in here as long as they aren't so many or so big that they're going to break down really quickly and cause things to get mucky. This is fine. So on to potting the plant up. Finally, the part I'm excited about. I have wanted to do this for a long time time. See this root mass? It's not that big. I could probably put more soil in here, but I kind of like the idea of this sitting down a little bit lower because this is a decent sized plant and I don't want too much soil around it as it is. So that's going to be like a four inch lip there. I think that might be a bit much. Oh, that's more soil. All right. Try that again. Yeah, that's much better. I should have grabbed some steaks this is just going to flop right over as soon as I let go of it. This plant has had a bad growth habit to it for a few years, so I'm going to use this as an opportunity to try and correct that and pot it up at a slight angle. That way the branches are going straight up and down. They've been, it's been like this. <laughs> you see, that's, that's no good. That doesn't work. You can straighten those out. It'll even itself out. The plants know how to make it work. Ended up having just about the perfect amount of mix for this container. Need just a smidge more. I'm not concerned about this bit of root sticking up here, largely because these are plants that, as I've mentioned, very prone to rot. Having the top, I'd say no more than half inch of the root mass exposed, that's not a big deal. But next time I go out, I am going to grab a small bag of mix to blend into the top here because as I water, this is going to keep eroding down, right? The roots that are sticking up right now, largely more than likely the same roots that were sticking up when it was in that other container. Roots will naturally prune themselves as they hit air and have that exposure. And really that should just help drive more roots down into the soil. I'm really glad that that was enough soil. I did not want to have to go out and get more. There it is. Isn't that
that look nice? Yeah, it's wonky because as I mentioned before, the plant was at an angle. That will straighten itself out under the grow lights. This is... Oh, it feels so good to have this done. This plant had reached a point where keeping it hydrated was becoming very, very difficult. That's the telltale sign that it's time to repot a plant, right? Just keep watering and just ugh, droops down. Water it, droops down. In general, that's not great for the plant itself. You don't want to be soaking them constantly. You'd like for the soil to have an even moisture instead of yo-yoing all over the place. That was one thing I didn't talk about. Soil moisture and just the soil that was already around that root mass. If it were summer, I probably would have worked some more of that potting mix out from the root mass on the plant so that more of the fresh mix could get in there. It didn't look like it was so broken down and muddy that it would cause a problem, especially since I'm pretty sure this mix that it's in is going to drain very well without needing to add anything to it. So I didn't bother. And y'all saw, there wasn't much of a root mass on this thing anyways, considering how big the plant is. It's just so over potted or under over under potted that other container wasn't big enough had it had more soil in it maybe it would have been that doesn't matter here we are that's done you can go ahead and get this moved back into the grow space give it a water and then can resume normal saturday vloggy nonsense you get those treats get your bedtime cookies pumpkin it's getting late and good timing for it to be getting late the predator mites just showed up take these out to the grow space and get them spread around this is not this is dumb i should not be carrying this like that there it is live bugs talked about this last week with all the stuff going on with the croton who's back here by the way it's been a few days since the repot seems to be good it's a little close to the grow lights it's not seeming to mind it hasn't dropped a single leaf that i've noticed it's not drooping or anything like that, which I'm not entirely surprised by. I didn't disturb the roots on that. I didn't want to mess with it and tick it off any more than's necessary since it's already going through some things. So what I have here, got a packet and a box, nice big box. I wanted to be able to give this predator mite situation a fair shot. So I ordered a ton, I mean a ton more. Why do I see ladybugs in here? I'm assuming they included the ladybugs as a promotional freebie. I don't remember ordering those. They have some interesting things written here. Nature's Good Guys, that's the brand, the company who's selling these. Live ladybugs are groomed and fed to be the best general soldiers in any organic garden, greenhouse, grow room, patio, rooftop, or anywhere pests exist. Ladybugs are aggressive, beneficial insects in both the adult and larval stage. As ladybugs feast on pests, they also lay eggs. Released several times during growing season to guard against aphids, mealybugs, spider mites, thrips, and other soft-bodied, slow-moving insects. Then it says, remember, with beneficial insects, think preventative care. That's very true. The entire reason I put all these predator mites out several weeks ago, a couple months ago, really, I started doing this, was at the first sign of the spider mites, I put them out. But I guess it was just too late, or they weren't doing their job. That's nifty that they've included some ladybugs because I was thinking that I should probably release a few more. Well, that worked out well. We'll release those along with the mites. Pulled out a bag full more predator mites and then stickers, receipts, a pamphlet that has lots of good information in there about the different types of beneficials you can use. Been through all this in a separate video. I did a whole video on just releasing the predator mites, so I'm not going to go too far into depth on all of that, especially since we're here right now because that wasn't working out. So doing it again. When I say again, I'm referring to doing it again in a video. I've done uh, five, I believe, previous releases of the predator mites to this. So I've been staying on top of it. Don't know what happened there, but what I have here that's packed up in these vermiculite containers are the predator mites that you just shake out loosely, like you're seasoning the plants with predator mites. And I've diversified the species too. There are different types of predator mites that are better for different things. I ordered one gigantic container, 12,500 of the Scamitis type predator mites, which are supposed to be one that is well more affordable. And then I have a whole bunch of others of the Californicus type. The rest that are in here, I believe are the special blend. I mentioned in the last video that perhaps what had happened, I've been mostly ordering special blends and they may have been more heavy or perhaps just the mites that were being more successful living longer were the soil dwelling types that are great with fungus gnats and you know things that live down in the soil because i really haven't had many issues with fungus gnats this year at all i barely ever see flying insects out here period unless they're mosquitoes there are plenty of mosquitoes but i'm not concerned about those they're annoying but they're not hurting the plants so i have all of these right here to release i wish i had a macro lens 
for situations like this. You could see them crawling around inside these containers. They just look like little specks of dust. I'm not gonna spend two grand on a lens just for like the two occasions in the year where I'm releasing predator mites, but that would have been neat. It's good to check them out, make sure there's movement inside of them. All these containers look like there's some movement. I see it mostly at the surface and when you lift the lids up on these, you can usually see some of them on these felt pads that are up there. So I know that there's a good amount of activity in these, which is great. That's fantastic. I want to make sure they're alive. It's an important piece of the process, right? Put out a whole bunch of dead mites. That's not really going to do anybody any good. Right here, just the ones that are packed in vermiculite, looking at about 30,000, a little over 30,000 predator mites, which sounds ample and you think that that would be enough, but no, I'm going full blown, full force here. I also have 125 of these little satchels. Have 100 of the special blend predator mites over here and then 25 of the Californicus over here. And these little satchels, similar to what you would do for the soldier larvae when you're trying to get rid of things like white fly and aphids. Little bags with a card, you wrap it around a branch, hang it up and that's it. So something like this is just an extra thing I'm doing so that I can ensure that any plants where I'm like, okay, the mites have been a problem here. There's something more direct right within that plant instead of sprinkling the perlite, or not the perlite, sprinkling the vermiculite on the plant and just hoping for the best. And then with all these, they need to be released either in the early morning or at night, dawn or dusk. Spray everything down with water so that they can have a nice drink. And that's also going to help the vermiculite stick as it gets shaken onto the plants. And that is it. I will shut off the lights as soon as I'm done spreading them. If I weren't filming this, then I'd shut them off right now. I'm sure that they would appreciate more darkness as it is. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna go ahead, spray the plants down, some moisture on top of everything, turn the lights off and get these spread around and we'll have another look in the morning. I can't imagine that there'll be anything to talk about that quickly, but Oh, maybe, we'll see. I'd film the process of spreading them around, but the lights are gonna be off and I've done it before. You take the lids off these things, you shake them, not that big a deal. And then with the sachets, I'm just, I'm gonna be hanging a ton of them. There's a lot here and I don't think that there are a ton of branches. This croton back here is going to be covered. There's gonna be a lot of little tea bags full of mites on there. Uh, yeah, good morning. It makes no difference to you guys what time of day it is. So it was just quick cut. Uh, yeah, the next day, got them all spread out shut the lights off for a long time so that there is a good resting period and the predator mites would feel good about being able to get out and do their thing eating spider mites. That was, I think, the most disgusting thing I've ever done in the garden. Grow space, whatever, that's not true. Cleaning out this pond when I had fish in it, that was usually pretty gross. In total, if you count all the little bags of eggs, I didn't mention that. So all these bags, these little, things that look like tea bags that are hanging inside the croton over there. I have them spread all over the place. Those are eggs. And they say that there should be about 250 eggs per baggie and that they'll hatch out over a four week period. So that's like a second step. So I did the, uh, we'll call it powdered form for the, they were in the, what is it, vermiculite. And then the other one, the big bottle was in what seemed to be more of a dirt like substance, it had an interesting odor to it. As I was saying, between the adult mites and the eggs, that are there inside those baggies, I've released 61,750 predator mites. That's assuming all the eggs hatch out and everything. You get what I'm saying though. It was a lot. It was messy and dusty. And uh, by the time I was done, I really very strongly felt that I myself was covered in mites. I probably wasn't, but there were times when I was trying to get them up into the top of the croton over there and into the hibiscus and they were definitely coming down on me. I was done. I went in that house, stripped my clothes off in the laundry room, threw them in the washer and went right to the shower. I felt so gross, which I'm sure is largely mostly in my head. But here we are. This is done. I have the little baggies hanging up all over the place. I went heaviest with the baggies anywhere that was up high, places where I'm going to be potentially more likely to not notice a problem arising. So I don't get up on a ladder every day when I'm out here walking around to see what's going on. And right now I'm holding you guys up above my head. You can see it from the camera fairly well, but from down here where I'm standing, this is about eye level, this, that's more like what my view is. The thought is that having the baggies up there in addition to the vermiculite, the adult ones spread around up there, that should be fairly preventative. I also went heaviest on the plants that tend to have the most spider, pro uh, spider, spider mite problems, like the hibiscus, anything that regularly pushes out new foliage. So plants that aren't slowing down that much this time of year. So we'll have the thematophyllum here. It's always putting out new growth and that fresh new growth is something the spider mites like. It's a nice thin 
easy to eat foliage. So they'll chow down on that. So I want to make sure there were plenty of those packets up there. And of course, back there in Mr. Freckles, who I haven't seen any spider mites on, but you know, if Mr. Freckles had spider mites, I'd be devastated because that's my favorite plant out here. Mr. Freckles, that's my baby up there. I don't want anything bad to ever happen to that one. And the croton itself, which is one where I had noticed the most spider mites, like I talked about in last week's video, I think I put around 20 to 24 of those bags in there. I know I needed to go heavy in there and that plant is a lot harder to get that vermiculite up into. The waxy foliage just tends to repel that material. So it's a lot harder to get the adults to stick to that one. So there are lots of bags. I, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think I need to order more. More of the adults. I, I want to wet the croton down again and really go heavy on there. By the time I was done with everything, all the other plants, I knew I was gonna be heavy with the bags on that one. I didn't have a ton left and I would like for this to be heavier coated. So like I said, a lot of the, that material was just falling right off the plant. And I sprayed it down with the water bottle, like I showed just prior to this, but still wasn't sticking very well. So I want to give that another go. And then in the process of doing all this, you may have noticed that things are looking a little bit different over here. There's some plants that are missing. All the Cordelin Fruticasas talked about in last week's video. I said that if I pull those out, and it looks like there's a bug problem going on with those, they're out of here. I had only brought them in because bringing them inside was just, it was a very last minute decision. Winter or winter-like temperatures came out of nowhere in the middle of October, a few weeks earlier than normal, and I didn't have the time I usually take to plan out what I wanna bring in and save and what I was going to treat as an annual. So I brought everything in. Cordelins can be major pest magnets, particularly with spider mites and mealybugs. That's been my experience anyways. So I had, theorized that potentially what was happening and why there were spider mites all over this one was partially because I I had this dense growth of cordelins here that was a lot harder to get the spider mite powder to get this dust into there. So the adults weren't able to get in there and eat the spider mites like I would prefer. And then they were, you know, moving all around. When I pulled this out, I didn't see a ton of spider mites on the cordelins, but I saw a good amount of mealybugs. And y'all know I've been battling those mealybugs for years, so they just... Toss them out to the driveway. I am going to go ahead. I, I can't bring myself quite yet to go ahead and throw them away. So I'm going to spray them down very, very, very heavily. Give them a few days outside. We have some frosty temperatures coming up that'll help take the foliage off of them. I'll be able to strip them down to just some stems. Get them nice and soapy and maybe I'll bring one or two of them back in. Because I'm also going to be trying to place an order from <laughs> the Nature's Good Guys for the Crypto Mill and Ananas Machininininis. That was right there. They call them mealybug destroyers. It's a type of lady beetle that is supposed to be really good at eating ladybugs. Not all, not ladybugs. They're supposed to be good at eating mealybugs. Like you tell my brain's a little bit frazzled. It's been a busy morning. Simmer the brain down and get the point across here. Mealybug destroyer lady beetles eat mealybugs. Not all types of mealybugs, but they are supposed to be pretty good about eating them. You know, lady beetles of all types have a voracious appetite and they are supposed to go to soft scale too. The mealybugs are normally an issue on the areca palm. That's always where they've been a big deal. And sometimes on the Dracaena back here, which I did see what looked like some meal, you can't even see it. There's a Dracaena back there. You see it? The Reflexa with the very, you get it. Usually see mealybugs on that plant. It looked like there were a couple of them on there. For the time being, cotton swab with some alcohol on the tip and I just go around and poke them, get them myself, have to do it by hand. I think that this space is too big with too many plants for that to be a practical way to control the mealybugs. It's fine if you're just noticing the problem. I'm not, but the, the, I'm not, how? It's so tall. The mealybugs hang out anytime they're in the Eureka Palm all the way in the very top. It's never down low inside the plant that I notice them. It's always way up high out of reach. But that's why I want to get the mealybug <laughs> destroyer lady beetles in here to help handle that problem. Downside, they're pretty pricey, but I've already gone in this far with the spider mites or the predatory mites, so why not? I'll probably order some beneficial nematodes too, just, you know, I'm already doing all this other stuff, may as well just mix them with some water, water into the plants. It'll help further control the fungus gnat. It's non-issue, I don't have an issue with fungus gnats, but it will help keep that from being a problem, hopefully as long as there's something there for them to eat. So yeah, that's that's where we are on the spider mite journey. I also realized something fantastic yesterday. I mean, it's not fantastic, but I have noticed, and I'm sure y'all have noticed all the cupped foliage and just the unhappiness on some of the plants that are over here on these shelves. 
And when I went to turn the lights off, I, I have an app that I use to control the lights. None of these would turn off. None of them. I just pressed the button, nothing. Apparently when the windows got replaced, somebody unplugged these from their timer and plugged a random extension cord, a, one that matches this one, I have a white extension cord on here, into the Bluetooth timer. So since November, these lights have been on 24 hours a day. Oops. I have them set to go off at a time when I'm usually in bed, so I just had, I didn't notice. Now I know, that's good. The plants, they're going to appreciate having some downtime in the evening without the grow lights on top of them. And then hopefully we'll get some better looking foliage out of them too. Won't have as much cupping. As things stand right now, the spider mites are mostly a problem on the Longiloba alocasia over here. I went very, very heavy with the predator mites. I'm only going to give that like a week, maybe two, and that's about it. I think it's a lot easier to just cut out the foliage that spider mites on it and toss it. This is a plant that'll just, it'll keep putting out new growth. So I'm not concerned about, even if I cut it all off, it should be fine. This is a fairly vigorous form of alocasia. So it's getting a very, very brief period to get looking better and that's it. Oh, also see the orchids. I've been wondering like, why are my cat layers all shoveled? Because the poor things haven't been getting any nighttime. Oh, back and forth from topic to topic. That's how we know it's time for the video to come to an end. Another thing I hadn't mentioned, that's when I was repotting the croton. I have been talking about giving this a heavy prone. I'm going to wait until springtime when I move it outside. If you've been watching the channel for a few years, then you know that whenever I move this outside, it goes through that acclimation period where it usually drops some leaves. They don't like to be moved that much and just the drastic change between artificial light and real light. And foliage scorches and it tends to just not look that great for a few weeks. I don't bother acclimating it anymore. I found that the six weeks it takes to acclimate the plant doesn't have a payoff acclimating it to full sun outdoors, that is, or nearly full sun outdoors, mostly late morning into afternoon sun. Taking the time to gradually introduce it to more and more lights so that doesn't have any scorch when you move it is really what we should do for the majority of plants. But with the croton, at least at this size, with smaller ones, I don't know if I would do it this way, but it's gotten big enough to where when it loses a few leaves, I don't really notice and I don't really care. And after six weeks has passed, we're into like mid June, early July, and then I'm just now getting to put it where it needs to go. That takes too long. So we don't get to move the plants out as early as we used to because it doesn't get warm as early as it used to. It stays fairly chilly. I'm not moving my plants out in April like I used to. I'm moving them out in May. So there's less time for them outdoors. And after all that time you spend acclimating them, it's still a croton. Things like the wind exposure changes and obviously the light changing, even though it's been acclimated to it, it still drops leaves and looks like garbage. Looks like garbage is a bit of a dramatic statement. It doesn't look like garbage, but my whole point there, I'm gonna hold off on pruning it because I figure the best time to go ahead and prune it will be when I move it out because I'll be moving it into a spot where it gets more light. It's gonna have some scorch on the foliage. So at that time, I'll cut it down by about a third get to fill back out down low. I actually kind of like when a croton's open down low and really full up high, but I would like to get some more thickness down there inside those stems and it could just use it. It's a small tree shrub. They need pruning every now and then. So I think that would be the more appropriate time to do that. Most practical time anyways, right? It'll have a stronger flush out when it's outside in the natural light. And then it's not going to have to go through that acclimation period with the new growth because it's going to be coming out with that light already on it. So that's the move I've made with that. And now I just have to I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do over here, whether I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep the cordolins, and I think that's it. I don't like spending a ton of time out here right now because I just, I feel dirty. Like I know that the mites are everywhere and I feel like they're on me. I know that they're not, but I feel like they are. It's a neurotic thing, can't help it, it's just me. And I'm fine with it. It just means keeping the plants watered and not hanging out out here for too terribly long while I'm waiting for these predator mites to do their thing and work their way into the plants and not like be rubbing on me and brushing on me and making me feel itchy. Again, I know it's in my head, but doesn't make it not real. If I itch, I itch. Overall, I'm happy and satisfied with the week. Plants are perking up, looking nice over on the shelves with their new lights. The croton seems happy as can be. It's been in this new container for about a week now. It's, it has, I think it's been six days since I started the video. So we're pushing a week here, not seeing a leaf drop. It's not wilting quickly at all prior to this. I was having to water this thing two or three times a week. So that's really good. The only thing I have to watch out for, as I mentioned, is going to be the soil staying too moist. There are a lot of holes in that pot and it's gonna have airflow over there. So I highly doubt that that's going to be an issue. I'm gonna to have to be careful when I water this so it'll not splash all those little bags. I tried to get them up as high as I could. I may go in and move some of them up. I have a lot on the very middle inside, so it's hard to see, but I might take some of the lower ones and move them 
all up even higher in there. That way when I'm watering, I don't have to wrap the spray coming through it. And like that bag right there, that's gonna get wet. I need to move that. Hey, orchid shows next week in St. Louis, Missouri Botanical Gardens. Hasn't been on for a few years. There should be a whole new setup. They have a whole new like restructured building that they're doing it in and I can't wait. It's been, it's been a few years since I've gone as it is for everybody because you know, COVID had it shut down for a while and then construction but I'm thinking it's probably gonna be pretty cool. Look different from all the other times I've gone. So I'm going to head out there next weekend more than likely. Anybody else going? Comment down below, let me know. It's pretty neat the way they do it. They stage everything up. It's not like tables with orchids on them. They try and naturalize it as much as possible. There's little waterfalls and streams and all these trees that they work the orchids into. It's absolutely beautiful. It's really worth going if you're in the St. Louis area. I would highly, highly, highly recommend checking it out starts this upcoming weekend and goes through most of February, I believe. It's not just orchids, they work them in with all kinds of beautiful tropical plants. It's you just like plants and really good fresh smells of all the leaves and the orchids and everything, I'd check it out. Okay, I'm going to prune off some stalks on this heliconia back here and then have a nice weekend. I hope you all have a nice weekend too. Comment down below, say hi, I love talking to everybody. And of course, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye-bye.